Here's your lecture for chapter 10. There is a second video that I've uh, made that has all of the equations that you're going to encounter over the course of chapter 10. So I encourage you to watch that first. <clears throat> Write down all of the equations so you have them on a sheet next to you. So as we go through these problems, when we hit a problem uh, or, or an example question, you can pause me work out the problem using that sheet of equations next to you, and then come back and see how we've worked it, okay? So chapter 10 is all about gases, and uh, gases have some basic properties that we've sort of already talked about earlier in the semester, talked about solids, liquids, and gases. And uh, just to focus on the properties of gases themselves, one is that they're compressible, and the reason for that is because there's space between the molecules. Unlike solids and liquids, there's actually room between the molecules here. So you can move those molecules closer together, which means that gases are compressible. They assume the shape and volume of the container and that they have very low densities in comparison with liquids and solids. <clears throat> now, the main thing that we're going to uh, scientists have used to study gases is called kinetic molecular theory. And the idea is that... Um, the model predicts correct behavior under most conditions. Um, but like most models, kinetic molecular theory is not perfect. Um, when you get to extremes of temperature and pressure, um, kinetic molecular theory kind of falls apart. But under most conditions, uh, especially those that we're going to deal with, the, the kinetic molecular theory model works quite well. <clears throat> so the main parts of the kinetic molecular theory are these is that we have a collection of particles in constant motion. So gases really, the gas particles, uh, gas molecules never really stop moving, okay? The only times that they do stop moving is when we get to temperatures that are uh, low enough that pretty much all molecular motion ceases. But until we get to that point, um, the gas particles are in constant motion. Part two is that there are no attractions or repulsions between the particles. Basically, we treat them as if they are billiard balls that are just going to bounce off of each other like, uh, like hard marbles or, like I said, billiard balls. Okay, They bounce off the sides of the container and they bounce off of each other with no attraction or repulsion. There's a lot of space between the particles um, compared to the particles themselves. So lots of room in between those individual molecules. And the last part is that the speed of the particles increases with increasing temperature. So if I take a collection of gas molecules and I raise the temperature, they're going to move faster. And conversely, if I cool them down, they're going to move slower. And I sort of already mentioned this uh, before, is that if we get down close to absolute zero, almost all molecular motion ceases, including physical travel or, or kinetic travel. Okay. So there are three, uh, excuse me, four main things that we can um, measure with gases, and those are pressure, volume, the amount of gas, and temperature. And what we have in this image is a, a basic um, version of what's called a manometer. Oops, manometer. Okay, and this was how they started to, uh, scientists started to understand um, gases. Basically, down at the bottom here, you have uh, a pool of mercury, okay? And back in the day, they didn't understand that mercury was uh, a neurotoxin. And so you would actually have scientists immersing themselves like elbows deep in pools of mercury because they had no idea that it was even remotely dangerous. It was just liquid metal. Um, and so what they have is they, they started with a vacu an evacuated tube and they Im inverted it into the pool of mercury. And what they found was that when they released the vacuum, the mercury got pulled up into the tube. And then what they did was they quite literally delineated the sides of the tube with markings in millimeters, right? And they found that um, under normal conditions at sea level, the mercury filled the tube up to a height of 760 millimeters of mercury. And so what they decided uh, after a little bit of time and, and work was that this was the same thing as one atmosphere, okay? And then they saw, you know, with changes in the weather, 
Sometimes that, uh, you know, when a big storm would roll in, we say that the pressure is dropping. That's what we're talking about is that when heavy weather would roll in, the level of mercury would actually go lower in the tube because the pressure of the atmosphere on the pool of mercury was slightly less. And then on, on days of really, really nice weather, the atmospheric pressure is pulling, pushing a little bit farther and the atmospheric pressure goes up a little bit. But they standardized the idea that 760 millimeters of mercury was uh, standard pressure. That's at one atmospheric pressure. Okay. So the idea of pressure, those of you that are, are taking physics or have taken physics, is basically force over area. So when we talk about atmospheric pressure, we're talking about all of the air above us and around us pushing down on us. Okay, and thankfully we live in, on a planet where, you know, everything is, is a manageable level, um, so to speak. Like we are able to comfortably withstand the pressure of the atmosphere above us and around us. So if we were on, if we were to sort of transport, transport ourselves to some place like Jupiter, Jupiter is infinitely massive. Well, not infinitely, but much, much more massive than the Earth. And so you would have much, much more atmosphere pressing down on you and... Truth be told, if we were to be on the surface of Jupiter, we would be squashed in an instant by the weight of all that atmosphere and gas. Okay. So since pressure is the result of collisions, okay, so if we have a container of gas, all of those gas particles are moving at all times, so they're constantly colliding with the walls of the, of the container, and all those collisions is force over area, so that causes pressure. So if we increase the number of particles, we're getting more collisions and more pressure. Okay? But if we decrease the number of particles, we get fewer collisions and as a result, lower pressure. Now there's a lot of different kinds of units of pressure. Um, the most common is atmospheres. Second most common is millimeters of mercury. Now it also says, or tor. Now tor is named after an Italian scientist named, and I'm probably gonna spell his name wrong, Torricelli, okay? And right about the time that, that most scientists were coming up with this idea of pressure in millimeters of mercury, Torricelli was doing his work in Italy and he came up with the same idea and he decided that 760 Tor was the correct unit, okay? But we also know that 760 millimeters of mercury is one atmosphere. So 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor, okay? They are, they are the same unit, essentially. Now, why we have two units that mean the same thing with different names Still, why they haven't gotten rid of one or the other, I don't know. I wish I did knew, know the answer to why we still have TOR. Um, not sure. But that's what it's talking about when you see that T-O-O-R. Other units that are common are Pascals, named after a French scientist, which has, thankfully, different units than um, millimeters of mercury and TOR. Another common one is PSI. It's common in the United States. If you've ever filled up your car tires, you know that your car tire gets filled with, you know, 35 some odd PSI, pounds per square inch. And then we have atmospheres um, uh, is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or TOR. 1,125, 1, 101,325, excuse me, pascals is one atmosphere. 14.7 PSI is one atmosphere. Or 29.92 inches of mercury. Now this one is, we put this one in here because this is common for meteorology. Me, meteorology. Okay, if you were ever to look up barometric pressure on uh, a weather app, you'll find um, the barometric pressure given in inches of mercury. So let's do a little bit of conversion here. So um, lots of the problems that you're about to face or, or have already faced with um, mastering chemistry 
involve situations where you have to convert units of pressure. So we're going to use those equivalents just like we've done all the other conversions in our class. So we start with our given information, 0.311 atmospheres, and we want to go to millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. So we end up with an answer of 236 millimeters of mercury. Now, just as a reminder, as we hit these example problems, I encourage you to try and hit pause, work out the problem on paper, and then come back and watch how the problem is um, worked out. That will be your most beneficial use of this time watching this video. And so there are a number of gas laws that we're going to um, encounter. And the first that we're dealing with is called Boyle's Law. And it is the relationship of pressure and volume. Okay, so the temperature and the amount of gas are going to be remain, remaining constant. The pressure of the gas sample increases for a decrease in volume. Now, this is something that you've encountered in your uh, real life probably at some point in time. Um, most of us have tried to, um, using like a bicycle pump, most of us have tried to cover the end of the hose of the bicycle pump and then press the pump down. And it gets more and more difficult the farther you press, right? Until it eventually pushes your thumb off at the end of the hose. That's because as you decrease the volume inside the cylinder of the gas pump, it increases the pressure. Okay, so the important thing to recognize about Boyle's Law is that volume and pressure are inversely proportional. This is extremely important relationship okay, for interpretation of, of, of things. So you can determine whether or not pressure will go up or down or volume will go up or down depending on that relationship. You can do that even without numbers in most cases. And I encourage you as you do these problems to be able to look at the answers you get and say, wait a minute, that's not right because the rate relationship says it shouldn't be, okay? So let's take a look at a, an uh, example of how this works. So if the amount of gas and the temperature of the gas are the same, so you see that we have the same number of, of um, brownish burgundy colored uh, marbles or whatever inside each cylinder, if I decrease the volume that pressure or, or the, the cylinder we've in the right hand picture, we've decreased the volume of that cylinder by pressing down on it on the piston. We've now halved the volume and by decreasing the volume by one half, we've doubled the pressure. Okay, so inversely proportional as the volume decreases, the pressure increases. So if volume goes down, then pressure goes up and vice versa. If volume goes up, pressure will go down. Okay, inverse proportionality. Right, so Boyle's Law relates pressure and volume. Okay, so even if you weren't given these equations at the top of the slide, okay, the question that you want to ask when you're faced with any of these gas problems, here's your question. What is changing. Okay, that is your main concern when you're reading through these problems. This, the problems that students have most often with this type of work is interpreting the word problem. Okay, So the question that you want to answer is what is changing? Okay, So in this case, so we have a cylinder equipped with a movable piston and the applied pressure is four atmospheres, there's pressure, and a volume of six liters. There's volume, okay? So it says, what is the volume of the cylinder if the applied pressure is decreased by one atmosphere? So we're changing a volume and we're, or excuse me, a pressure and we're changing a volume. So volume and pressure are the things that are changing here. Now a useful tactic is to make a list, okay? So even if you're not entirely sure what's changing in this problem, if you make a list of the things that you're given, it will help you to figure it out. So we're given a pressure of four atmospheres and a volume of six liters, okay? 
Then it says if the volume is changed, what is, um, excuse me, if the volume of, of the cylinder, what is the volume of the cylinder if the applied pressure decreases? So we have a new pressure of one atmosphere, and it wants to know what the new volume is. Okay, so you see by making my list, I have P and V, P and V. So you can look at your list of equations, and you'll find the one that is just pressure and volume. Okay, pressure and volume are the things that are changing. Okay, so Boyle's Law. So what we want to solve for V2, so I'm going to rearrange my equation and say V2 equals P, P1 V1 over P2. And then I can simply plug in my numbers. Okay. Four atmospheres times six liters divided by one atmosphere gives me 24 liters. Okay, so here's where you want to use that relationship of pressure and volume and determine whether or not this answer makes any sense. So we have a pressure of four atmospheres, and then we decrease the pressure. So if the pressure goes down, that means the volume should go up. Our initial volume was four atmospheres, or excuse me, six liters. And our volume has gone up to 24 liters. So by that inverse relationship, we can see that our answer, at least on that level, makes sense. So our next one relates volume and temperature. So the volume of a gas and its Kelvin temperature, and I want to make this very, very, very clear, I'm going to underline this a lot, that when we're doing gas law problems, all gas law problems, and let me say that again, all gas law problems, your temperatures need to be in Kelvins for these equations to work. So with Charles' law, we have a direct proportionality, okay? Volume and temperature are directly proportional. Okay, that means that if volume goes up, temperature goes up. And if temperature goes up, volume goes up. If temperature goes down, volume goes down. Okay, they move together, okay? So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2 is Charles' law. So Charles' law is actually one of the ways that scientists determined the value for absolute zero. <clears throat> so they used Charles' law, and they related volume to temperature, and they were able to extrapolate back all the way to if we reached zero volume, what would be the temperature? And that's how they arrived, one of the ways that they arrived at zero Kelvin is absolute zero. So let's take a look at a problem involving Charles' Law. So again, your question is going to be, what is changing? So even if we didn't know that we were going to be doing Charles' Law, how would we figure that out? So we have a sample of gas that has a volume of 2.8 liters and an unknown temperature. When the sample is submerged in ice at zero degrees, so there's another temperature, the volume decreases to 2.5. So I've got two volumes and two temperatures. Nothing else in this problem is related to any of the other things that you can measure with a gas. So the only things that are changing are volume and temperature. All right, so in this problem, we want to find T1. So we're using Charles' Law, and we're going to rearrange to solve for T1. So I'm going to go through those steps because it's a little bit weird if your algebra is not super strong, okay? So I'm going to multiply T1 to the other side to get it on top. So V1 is equal to V2 T1 over T2. And then I ultimately want to get T1 all by itself. So I'm going to multiply T2 to the other side. So we get V1 T2 equals V2 T1. Okay, and then I'm going to divide V2 to the other side so that I have T1 by itself. So 
I'm going to do that right down here on the left. So V1 T2 over V2 equals T1. Okay. So this is just showing the steps for the rearrangement of the equation. Okay. So once I've rearranged the equation, remember our temperature needs to be in Kelvin, so I'm going to add 273 to zero, Kel to zero Celsius. So I'm going to have 2.8 liters times 273K over my V2, which was 2.57 liters. So I end up with 297 Kelvin. Now, here's the question. Does the answer make sense? Your initial volume was 2.8 liters, and it decreased to 2.5 liters when we decreased the temperature. So that means that if our relationship holds, our initial volume should be higher, well, it is higher, and our initial temperature should also be higher. So we started at 270, our initial temperature is 297 at 2.8 liters, and if we cool it to zero, te temperature went down, volume went down to 2.57 liters. Okay. And then if we subtract 273, we should end up with 24 degrees Celsius. Okay. So when there are more than two things uh, changing, so with Boyle's law, we have pressure and volume. Charles law, we have volume temperature. So two things each. But what if there are more than two things changing in a particular equation? We can actually combine Boyle's and Charles laws into what we call the combined gas law. So P1 V1 equals P2 V2. There's uh, Boyle's law. And then P1 over T1, excuse me, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. There's Charles law. So let's take a look at a question involving Charles or combined gas law. Boy, I can't speak today. Okay, so we have a sample of gas at an initial volume of 1.5 milliliters, 158 milliliters, <laughs> and a pressure of 735 millimeters of mercury and a temperature of 34 degrees C. So I have volume, pressure, and temperature. There's three things there. Then if the gas is compressed to a new volume, so volume is changing, and heated to a temperature of 85 degrees C, temperature is changing, what is its final pressure? So pressure is changing. So that clues us in that we're going to be using the combined gas law. Okay, we have three things changing in this equation. So again, it's useful to make a list. So I have P1 is 735 millimeters of mercury, V1, 158 milliliters, T1 is 34 degrees C, which is 307 Kelvin. Remember, always use Kelvin temperatures. Always, always, always. P2, we don't know. V2 is 108 milliliters. And T2, we're going to put down here in between the copyright. Um, T2 is 85 degrees C plus 273 gives us 358 Kelvin. Okay, so I'm going to take my ideal gas or combined gas law and I'm going to rearrange it. And I'm not going to belabor the steps, but I, I hope that you're, um, after the previous example, you're. Uh, Algebra rearranging is on par, so we're going to end up with P1 V1 T2 over T1 V2 equals P2. Okay, so once I have that rearranged correctly, I can just plug in the numbers. 735 millimeters of mercury plus 158 milliliters times 358 Kelvin. And I have that in parentheses so that just to remind you, that should be a times, uh, to remind you that uh, order of operations here. So just be careful how you're entering things in your calculator. And we have 307 Kelvin times 108 
milliliters. So we end up with um, 1254 millimeters of mercury. And if we are careful with our sig figs, we should be reporting this to 1.25 times 10 to the three. Now Avogadro's law, as you might expect, is related to moles. And the deal with, uh, with that is that if you have more, more gas, it's going to create more um, pressure. Um, it's going to take up more space, so to speak. So more gas equals more space. So if you imagine a balloon, and if you're blowing up the balloon, you are you know, putting more moles of gas into that balloon, and the balloon expands to a larger volume. Okay? So Avogadro's law, volume and moles are directly proportional. So as you have more gas, you should end up with more volume. So let's take a look at an example of Avogadro's law. So a 4.8 liter sample, so there's a volume, contains 0.22 moles, right? And N is moles. If I didn't explain that, that's, that's the case. So N is moles. How many additional moles? So there's another N of helium gas must be added to the sample to obtain a volume of 6.4 liters. So I've got the things that are changing are volume and moles. So Avogadro's law is V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Sorry, that's to be 2. And our task is to find N2, so I'm going to rearrange the equation. N2 equals V2 N1 over V1. So I'm going to plug in, once I've rearranged the equation, all I have to do is plug in the values. So N2, 6.4 liters times 0.22 moles over 4.8 liters gives us 0 0.29 moles. Okay, thinking about that relationship, that direct relationship. So we started with 4.8 liters and we ended with 6.4 liters. So our volume went up, which means that our moles should go up. And we went from 0.22 to 0.29. So our answer makes sense. Okay, so the ideal gas law, okay, is PV equals nRT, okay? So the value of R, the ideal gas constant, is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin, okay? Now, it's extremely important that you let this guide you for units, okay? If, you're, if you have to use R in any equation, the units of R have to match the units of everything else. So since R is a constant, gas constant, everything else has to change to match R. So the units must match R, okay? So pressure has to be in atmospheres, volume in liters, um, amount of gas has to be in moles, and the temperature must be in Kelvin, okay? So some students have, have referred to the, the ideal gas law as Pivnert, um, which I found really amusing the first time I heard it because it never occurred to me. Um, but uh, PV equals NRT, ideal gas law. So a thing called STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. Okay, And standard temperature and pressure, the pressure will be one atmosphere, and the temperature is zero degrees Celsius to 73 K. So anytime you see STP in a problem, that immediately gives you two pieces of information. Okay, so without explicitly saying one atmosphere in 273 K, many problems will say such and such happens at STP. Okay, so that immediately gives you those um, pieces of information. 
Now a convenient thing is that one mole of gas at STP, so looking at this first bullet point, one mole of gas occupies 22.4 uh, liters, okay? Now, this is a useful thing, but I also kind of want you to forget it, okay? I want you to focus on STP means this, okay? Because it's entirely easy, uh, entirely too easy for students to use that first bullet point in places where it's not appropriate, okay? so. That 22.4 liters only applies when you have one mole of gas. That's extremely important to remember. Okay, so let's calculate R at STP and one mole of gas. So I'm gonna take this out of the way so we can do our work. So PV equals NRT. So if I wanna solve for R, I'm gonna say R equals PV over and T, right? So I'm gonna plug in the values for STP and the one mole of gas. So R equals one atmosphere times 22.4 liters, which is the volume at STP of one mole of gas over one mole times 273 Kelvin. And when we calculate that, we get a value of 0 0.08205 and some other digits. Um, and given the limits of these sig figs that we're using, and really we should just be a single sig fig, but we are close enough to the actual value of the ideal gas constant. Right, let's take a look at an ideal gas problem. So we want to calculate the volume occupied by 0.85 moles of nitrogen gas at a pressure of 1.3 atmospheres and a temperature of 315 K. Now here's the question. Is anything changing? And the answer is no. Okay, we don't have a volume going to another volume or a pressure going to another pressure or a temperature going to another pressure or a moles going to another moles. We just have individual values for moles. So if that's the case, you're looking at PV equals NRT to solve your problem. Okay, we're not looking at any of the other gas laws because they all involve changes in something, two or more things. Okay, so in this case, it's useful again to make a list. So we are interested in finding the volume. So PV equals NRT. Let's rearrange to solve for volume. NRT over P, right? So once I've rearranged things, I'm checking first that all of my units are in the correct thing. So I have moles, atmospheres, kelvins. Great, and I already know the value for R, that's a constant, so I always have that in my back pocket. So we have volume equals 0 0.845 moles times the gas constant, liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin, times our temperature in Kelvins, 315K, and all the, over the pressure, 1.37 atmospheres. Now let's take a look at units for a second so that we can see how this is all working so we understand how we end up at the correct unit. So in the top part of our equation, in the numerator section of the equation, moles divided by moles will cancel out. Kelvins on bottom times Kelvins will cancel out. Atmospheres on top divided by atmospheres, that'll cancel out. So leaving me with the only unit left is liters, which is a unit of volume. So we should have 15.9 liters as our answer. All right, let's calculate the molar mass of a gas from the ideal gas law, okay? Now there's a couple of ways to go about this, but we're gonna do it probably the most uh, simple way given that we know the mass. So all we need in order to get molar mass, so molar mass, capital MM, is mass over moles, right? 
we already have this part. So what I need is moles. And I have volume, temperature, pressure, and R. So all I need to do is find N. Okay. So I don't have anything changing in this equation. So that's usually a good way to start. Is there anything changing? The answer is no. So we're going to be looking at PV equals NRT. Right? And we're going to rearrange to solve for N. PV over RT. And so I can say 1.06 atmospheres times the volume times R08206 liters atmospheres moles Kelvin times the temperature 298K. And we get an answer of 4.8548 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And let's not forget sig figs, so I'm going to track at the third sig fig. Okay. So our molar mass is mass over moles. So we were given mass in the problem here. So all I have to do is divide mass by moles to get the molar mass. So 0.136 grams divided by 4.8548 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, tracking at the third sig fig, so my answer should be 3 sig figs. So we end up with 28.0 grams per mole. Right? So this very likely could be nitrogen gas, because nitrogen N2 has a molar mass of 28 grams per mole. All right, moving on. So partial pressures. So partial pressures are related to um, mixtures of gases. Okay, so each individual gas has its own pressure within the, the container. And the partial pressure of a component equals the fractional component times the total pressure. Okay, and we'll, I'm going to get into that here um, in just a little bit, so sort of towards the end of this lecture, I'm going to come back to this. Okay, but the idea here is that looking at this mixture, and let's say that this is um, a mixture of helium and uh, neon. So if my pressure of partial pressure of helium is 0.8, and my partial pressure of neon is 0.2, I add those together to get the total pressure of one atmosphere. Okay, but like I said, I'm going to get into partial pressures in more depth, how to calculate those from mole fractions um, in a little bit. In the meantime, I'd like to take a look at our next gas law, which is Dalton's law of partial pressures. Okay, and the idea with Dalton's law is that simply that the pressure total is just a sum of the partial pressures. So these are the partial pressures. So the partial pressure of gas A, partial pressure of gas B, partial pressure of gas C, and on and on for however many gases you have. Right? So thinking about what our air is like, our air is primarily nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, with lots of other gases mixed in and in smaller components. But if the partial pressure of nitrogen is 0.78, and the oxygen is 0.21, and the argon is 0.01, all that adds up to be one atmosphere, which is the pressure of our atmosphere, of our air. Let's take a look at an example problem here. Right, so if we have uh, a mixture of helium, neon, and argon, and that mixture has a total pressure, so pressure total, total pressure is 558 millimeters of mercury. The pressure of helium is 341. And the pressure of neon is 112. What is the partial pressure of the argon? Okay, so I can, let's apply Dalton's law so that pressure total equals the pressure of the helium plus the pressure of the neon plus the pressure of the argon. 
So if I, if I know this, this, and this, I can easily solve for the pressure of argon. So the pressure of argon simply equals the pressure total minus the pressure of the helium minus the pressure of the neon. So we have pressure of the argon. Total pressure was 558 millimeters of mercury minus the 341 for the helium minus the 112 for the argon or for the neon so it gives us the partial pressure of the argon is 105 millimeters of mercury Gases in chemical reactions. So we're getting into stoichiometry, right? We've done lots of things with stoichiometry over the course of the semester. And all we're doing is building another route to the mole bridge, okay? So everything in stoichiometry is related to moles. So now that we have the ability to deal with gases and calculate moles of gas, we can then use that to cross the mole bridge. But the idea is that the stoichiometry itself is no different. Okay, we may have to use ideal gas to get to moles and may have to use ideal gas to get out of moles, or we may have to use solutions, molarity to get to moles and then ideal gas to get out or vice versa. But this is just another path to calculate moles. Okay, but the idea is that, again, the stoichiometry doesn't change. All right, so given what we have here, and I'm going to cross this out and write it correctly balanced. So we should have 3H2 gas plus N2 gas gives us 2 NH3 gas. That was a bit of a typo when I first made this slide, and I apologize that it's still there. But so how many moles of ammonia are formed by the complete reaction of 2.5 liters of hydrogen at 381K and 1.32 atmospheres. Assume that there's more than enough N2. So N2 is our excess, so we don't have to worry about it. But we are given volume, temperature, and pressure, and we always know R, because that's a constant. So I have everything I need to use the ideal gas law to find moles. Okay, so I, ultimately I'm going to use that to find moles of hydrogen and then mole bridge to find moles of ammonia. Okay, but all I'm doing is I've, I've, I have a new path to get to the moles. So PVE equals NRT, N equals PV over RT. So I have volume, temperature, pressure, and R, so I'm going to solve for moles. So we have 1.32 atmospheres times 2.5 liters equals 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin times 381 Kelvin gives us 0 0.1055, tracking at the third sig fig, moles of H2. It's almost like magic. Okay, so once I know moles of hydrogen, all I need is a mole ratio to get to moles of ammonia. That's the part of the stoichiometry that is the same. So moles of hydrogen gas, and it's a 1 to 3 ratio. So we'll end up with 0 0.035 moles of NH3. Okay, so the only thing that's new is the application of the ideal gas law to find moles. Okay, and I can't stress that enough. The stoichiometry is no different. It's exactly the same. So quick review. So the idea that kinetic molecular theory, the, the model where the gases are widely spaced, there's no interaction between the gas particles, 
and the average kinetic energy depends on temperature. Pressure is force per unit area, and it results from the collisions of the gas particles with surfaces. We have our gas laws that show how one of the properties of the gas varies with another. Combined gas law joins Boyles and Charles. The ideal gas law allows us to calculate um, individual properties of the, the parts. And really, there should be a part here about Dalton's law and uh, stoichiometry. I think there used to be a, a second slide um, <laughs> part of this review. And there's not, but it's fine. So, but Dalton's law is um, individual partial pressures give us a total pressure. So the pressure of the individual gases add up to the total pressure of the system. And uh, stoichiometry is nothing new. So the only difference with the stoichiometry here is that we're using the ideal gas law in order to get to our mole bridge. Okay, so I said that I was going to get a little bit more in depth with um, how Dalton's law relates to partial pressures. And this is where our PowerPoint slide uh, sort of stops. So let's take a look at um, how partial pressure relates to ideal gas law and how mole fractions fit into all of the, this stuff. So if I want to know the total pressure of the system, if I have a mixture of gases, total pressure of a mixture, I can calculate it saying pressure total equals moles total RT over B, right? And I can even go uh, a little bit more in detail and say volume total, right? But I'm not going to uh, focus on that so much right here, right? And then in order to find pressure total, I can use Dalton's law saying that the pressure of A, gas A, pressure of gas B, plus the pressure of gas C for however many gases I have, okay? So pressure total is the sum of the partial pressures, right? So partial pressure is the same thing as saying the pressure of A divided by the pressure total. Okay, and then we also have the idea that mole fraction equals moles of A over moles total. So let's take a look at, at how we can apply this and sort of create a relationship. So if I take the ideal gas law for A, gas A, and total pressure, let's see how that plays out. So, so gas A if I just solve for the pressure of gas A, I'll have moles of A, RT, divided by volume, right? Over pressure total means that I have moles total RT over B. So guess what? Everything except for the moles cancels out of that equation. The R's cancel out, the T's cancel out, the V's cancel out. So pressure of A over pressure total is this equals moles of A over moles total, which equals the mole fraction of A. Okay, so the important parts of this are these, these pieces. Okay, partial pressure of A divided by the pressure total is the same thing as the mole fraction of A. So if I want to know just the partial pressure of A, Let's take a look at that. Pressure of A over pressure total equals mole fraction of A, right? So partial pressure of A equals mole fraction of A times the pressure total. That's a very, very useful set of relationships. All right, so let's look at a bit of an example problem. So here's our question. So what are the partial pressures
of H2 and helium. And I always forget to write this when I do this in class. We're dealing with 0.5 moles of, he of H2 and 1.25 moles of helium. So what are the partial pressures of those two things at a total pressure? of 8.4 atmospheres. Okay. So let's use our uh, relationship here to figure it out. So if the pressure of H2 over the pressure total equals moles of H2 over moles total, then my pressure of H2 equals moles of H2 over moles total times pressure total, right? So my pressure of H2 equals 0.5 moles H2 over my total moles, which is 1.75 times 8.4 atmospheres, means that the partial pressure of H2 is 2.4 atmospheres. Okay. Now I could simply subtract 2.4 from 8.4 to find the pressure of the helium, but I'm going to go through the process of calculating it sort of through the mole fraction just to show it. So 1.25 moles of helium over the total moles times the total pressure gives us six moles or six atmospheres of helium. Now, if we've done this correctly, my pressure of H2 plus my pressure of helium should equal the pressure total, and in which case it does. I have 2.4 plus 6 equals 8.4. Okay, so my math works out. So my partial pressures are the 2.4 and the 6. Let's do one that's a little bit more complex. So our next example problem goes like this. The gas mixture has 1.25 grams of nitrogen gas. And 0 0.85 grams of oxygen gas. And they're in a 1.55 liter container. At a temperature of 18 degrees C. We want to calculate the mole fractions and partial pressures of each. So there's our question. So first off, things in grams are not really going to be helpful to us because all of this stuff is related to moles. So my first step, we're going to convert to moles. 1.25 grams of nitrogen and it's 28.02 grams per mole of nitrogen dinitrogen, remember two nitrogens there, and it's 0 0.0446 moles of N2. In our oxygen, we have 0 0.85 grams of O2, 32 grams per mole, gives us 
gives us 0 0.02656. Tracking at the second sig fig. And we're going to track at the third sig fig for the nitrogen. So altogether, that gives we can immediately calculate total moles because that'll come in handy with dealing with mole fractions. So our total moles comes out to be 0 0.07116, tracking at the second digit there, right? Or in third decimal place, okay? All right, so our mole fraction of nitrogen is moles of nitrogen over moles total. So 0 0.0446 over 0 0.07116 gives us a mole fraction for the nitrogen of 0 0.63. Two sig figs because I'm tracking it the second sig fig for the total moles. Okay. And then my mole fraction of O2, moles of O2 over total moles. 0 0.0266, and I can round because I'm tracking at the second sig fig as long as they keep one extra digit. It's a mole fraction of 0 0.37. Now, just as a check, those should add up to equal one. Okay, if you only have two components, those two components should equal one, <laughs> okay? So uh, in order to calculate partial pressures, we need total pressure, All right? So I'm gonna use total moles And PV equals NRT. Okay, so we have pressure total equals moles total RT over V. So our total moles was 0 0.07116, tracking that second sig fig, times R. times our temperature, which was 0.0. And then all divided by the volume of our container. Okay. So we should get a pressure total equal to 1.0963, tracking at the second sig fig atmospheres. So now that I know the mole fractions and the total pressure, my pressure of N2 over pressure total equals the mole fraction of N2. So my pressure of N2 equals the pressure, uh, excuse me, the mole fraction of N2 times the pressure total. So we should have um, pressure of N2 equals 0 0.63, which was the mole fraction, times our total pressure, and that should be atmospheres. So we get an answer of 0.69 atmospheres as the partial pressure for N2. And then our pressure of O2 takes the same form, so the mole fraction of O2, well, it's not 2, it's a 7, times our total pressure, will give us 0 0.41 atmospheres. Okay? 
So loads of fun, these deal things dealing with um, partial pressures and mole fractions. These are, I'm not gonna lie, these often give headaches to students. Um, but if you keep that uh, mole fraction to partial pressure relationship in your head, at least keep the equations nearby, um, that should be not too much trouble, okay? So let's look at some other ways that we can use the ideal gas law. And one of the ways that we can use it, um, and I mentioned this previously when we did the molar mass problem, is molar mass determination. Okay. And in the example that we did earlier, we separately solved for moles and then divided by mass. But we don't have to. So if molar mass, I'm going to use capital MM for molar mass, if molar mass equals mass over moles, grams per mole, then I can rearrange that and say moles equals mass over molar mass, right? Then I can plug that into the ideal gas law. And what we get is a version of the ideal gas law that looks like this. Mass times RT divided by molar mass. So if I wanted to, I could rearrange and solve directly for the molar mass. Pretty handy. Right, so the other thing that we can use it for is density of gases. And I love this stuff because it's incredibly clever. Um, so with density of gases, so density equals mass over volume. And don't we have mass and volume in our ideal gas law as it's rearranged for molar mass? So get this. So density equals mass, and vo mass over volume. So if PV equals mass RT over molar mass, I can rearrange that and say density equals mass over volume equals molar mass times pressure over RT. Okay. And in the end, all I have done is rearrange this equation. Okay, I haven't done anything fancy. I've just rearranged the equation to get mass divided by volume on all, all by itself. Right. So let's get into something a little bit different, shall we? So speed and average kinetic energy. Okay. So average kinetic energy takes the same form as those of you that are, are taking or have taken physics. And it looks like this. So the average energy, average kinetic energy, EK, one half the mass times the velocity squared. In this case, we're going to say mu RMS. And I'll explain what that is. Squared. Okay. And mu RMS is the root mean squared velocity. Okay, so it's an, it's an average of the velocity of particles, the root mean squared of it. Okay, so how do we get this thing? How does this relate to anything that we've done so far? Well, the root mean squared is related to the ideal gas law through Avogadro's number. And we really don't need to get into the derivation, but you can look it up if you want to. But we can solve for mu RMS with an equation. It was 3RT over the molar mass under the square root. Now here's, here are some very important aspects. So molar mass is in kilograms per mole. And I'm going to put this, circle it in red, kilograms per mole, okay? Why is it that way? 
because R is related to energy now. Right? So we started this talking about energy, right? So if we're dealing with um, speed and velocity related to energy, we need R to be related to energy. So here, R equals 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, and remembering that a joule equals a kilogram times meter squared over second squared. Right, so this kilograms is why we need our molar mass to be in kilograms. Now R is still referred to as the gas constant. Okay, it's R is always the gas constant. But depending on how you're using R, what units you're using R, it can take on slightly different numerical values. So previously we were dealing with liters and atmospheres, so it was 0 0.08206. Here it's related to joules, so through some conversions we end up with 8.314. Okay, so how do we apply this information? So let's... Uh, come to a slightly less jarring color than the red, and let's answer a question. So which has a greater mu RMS, greater velocity, at 25 degrees C? Ammonia, oh, that was weird, ammonia, or ammonia gas or hydrochloric acid gas. Okay. Molar mass will tell you. I don't even have to do any calculations with this. Okay. I can simply tell based on the molar mass which one will win. So the molar mass of NH3 is roughly 17 grams per mole. And the molar mass of HCl is roughly 37 grams per mole. Now let's think about our equation. Mu RMS equals the square root of 3RT over the molar mass. Smaller equals faster. It's a faster mu RMS. Because the molar mass is in the denominator. Okay? So as the molar mass gets larger, the average velocity gets smaller because molar mass is in the denominator. Right? So in general, Smaller gases, smaller, lighter gases, are faster. Okay, so just without even having to calculate that all the way through, I can answer that question just based on the molar masses. Okay. So we have one more main topic. And it's the topic uh, of diffusion versus effusion. Okay, two different things. So diffusion is defined as migration due to random motion. Okay. Essentially, you put some, some gas particles in a container, and then due to random motion, they will eventually migrate out and fill the space. They're going to diffuse into the space. Now, effusion, on the other hand, is escaping um, through a hole or orifice. Now 
not sure I spelled orifice correctly, or pinhole or something. And you can think about uh, e-fusion as kind of like when you have a helium balloon and you keep it for a while, over time that helium balloon deflates and ends up on the ground. And that's because the individual molecules inside that uh, those individual atoms of helium are finding um, molecular sized holes in the latex and escaping through tiny holes. So over time, your helium balloon deflates because there's quite literally less gas in there, okay? So we're gonna be focusing on E-fusion, okay? We're not gonna worry about diffusion. It's just important to know the difference between the two. So the rate of effusion is proportional uh, to the molecular speed. Okay, and we have an equation for that. So the rate of effusion of gas A Rate effusion for A divided by the rate of effusion for B equals mu RMS for A divided by mu RMS B. And here's the fun part. So it comes out equaling molar mass of B divided by molar mass of A under the square root, okay? And that has to do, the reason that it flips, and I'm gonna go ahead and show it just because it's kind of fun math. The reason that it flips is that if I have mu RMS of A, that is three RT, not R, <laughs> R, R, three RT over molar mass of A, right? And if I divide that by mu RMS of B, 3RT over molar mass of A, and we would end up with the whole thing under the square root. So what do you do with fractions? When you divide by a fraction, you have to invert it and multiply. So that's the same thing as saying 3RT over molar mass of A times molar mass of B over 3RT. So the three RTs cancel out, leaving us with molar mass of B over molar mass of A, okay? But all of that aside, this is your important thing to, uh, to keep in here, okay? So with this, since the rate of effusion is directly proportional to um, the molecular speed, smaller, faster gases, Effuse faster. Okay? And heavier components, heavier, slower components, effuse slower. Okay? So let's do, for our very last thing, let's do a practice problem of that type. So if 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of N2 gas effuses in 105 seconds, how much hydrogen gas will effuse in the same time? You have to pardon my handwriting. It's been a lot of a lot of writing here. So what we're going to deal with is so mu RMS for H two over mu RMS for N two, and it doesn't matter how I do this. I could put N two on top. It really doesn't matter. Equals the molar mass of N two over the molar mass of H two. The important thing is that when I put them under the 
you know, go for the molar mass and put it under the square root, I need to make sure that I put b on top. The, the, I need to flip them. Okay. So let's see. So um, we have some x number of moles of H2 in 105 seconds over 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of N2 in 105 seconds. Okay, so essentially those, those 105 seconds, that part just drops out. Okay, so the, the, the length of time is not really essential here. Okay, and that's going to be equal to 28.014 grams per mole of N2 divided by 2.016 grams per mole for H2, all under the square root. That equals 3.728. So then I can solve for the X number of moles. 3.728 times 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4 gives us 8.2 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of H2 will effuse in 105 seconds. Now, does this make sense? Hopefully it does. So smaller, lighter gases will effuse faster. So in the same amount of time, I should get more hydrogen gas effusing over a given time.